So let's talk about this part. These are the final two installments, although they are not, uh, installment six was not complete. When Dickens died, he had, they had published three installments and he had written two and two third, or uh, he had written uh, two and two thirds more. So he'd written four and five, but six was not complete. So it was two of the three chapters that Dickens had planned. And we know that from the notes that he left behind. But the installments were 32 pages each. And so his biographer, best friend and cohort, John Forster, uh, went back and looked at some of the material that Dickens had excised for length or superfluity, whatever reason he might have done so. And he restored certain passages that are, not that are noted in the Penguin edition. They may not be noted if you have another uh, edition. And he padded out the uh, fifth and sixth number. He divided one chapter into two uh, and then added back excised material in order for the, the two numbers to look full. So what we have is a book that's just slightly under 50% what uh, done, just slightly. And I think that's covered in one of the 10,000 appendices that are in the Penguin edition, if, you, if you're looking at that one. Um, but let's talk about uh, chapter 17, because chapter 17, which is the opening of installment five, uh, is, is it's kind of different. It, uh, it's, it's kind of an abrupt change of, of pace in that it's uh, six months later after where we stopped last time. And if you remember that Jasper had said he would never speak about the, uh, the, the death or the mystery, the mystery of his nephew's disappearance. And now six months has passed and we have this change in pacing and mood. So if any, would anyone like to comment on uh, what happens in that chapter? Because it's, uh, it has very little to do, with, well, it has very little to do with the mystery. Um, except uh, for the fact that some of the characters have moved to London. Did anyone welcome the return of uh, Mr. Honey Thunder? We are, let's see, what page are we on in the, in the Penguin? Marini, unmute yourself. We are on page 187. 187. <clears throat> well, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Honey Thunder, I mean, just starting um, with his crazy name, but he comes on so strongly that he and um, he is he has decided to um, he's decided that Neville Landis is guilty. And therefore, he no longer wants to be, um, what is the word? Well, they have reached the majority. So he is legally, no longer right. legally obligated okay. to take care but of them. He doesn't really. want anything. I, I can't think of what the word, but, it, but anyway, he doesn't want anything to do with them. And um, he tells, he's turning them over to Chris Sparkle, who um, is happy to help them out in any way. But um, he's very, very belligerent and um, very adamant about um, Neville's guilt. And Chris Sparkle really stands up for himself and says, I don't agree with you. I'm his friend. I will remain his friend. And it, it goes on rather long. <laughs> um, Mr. Honey Thunder is not all that interesting a character to me, not nearly as much as Mr. Grugis. But anyway. That's the thrust of at least the beginning of it. Well, I know that you've read Little Dorrit and maybe some of the others of, of you have read Little Dorrit, but this passage, this whole chapter kind of reminds me of the kind of a interruption or apostrophe that Dickens would occasionally engage in to pick on some social issue. And so this reminds me of that long description of the circumlocution office, which has really very little to do with the plot of, uh, Little Dorrit, but uh, it, it 
it serves as an opportunity for Dickens to get a dig at something. And he clearly doesn't care for uh, philanthropy, uh, philanthropist ministers. Um, but let's see here. Um, and, and yet he was a philanthropist, <laughs> which is ironic. <laughs> I mean, he was with Urania House and all of that. But anyway. Oh, you mean Dickens? Well, yes. Dickens, I mean. <laughs> but he often... I, 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 no, he, he doesn't like phony philanthropists. I think he often did that without people knowing that he was involved. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Urania House was a, um, a project sponsored in large part by a woman named Angela Burdett Coates, Coots, who was the heiress to the Coots banking fortune and a great friend of Dickens's. And they co-sponsored this Urania House, which was a program to rehabilitate fallen women who apparently needed to be re rehabilitated. Um, I don't know a lot about it. I, it's not an area that I've studied, but um, well, let's continue to talk about what else is going on in this chapter? Because um, we get a picture of how Neville is doing six months later and how is Neville doing six months later? I shall wait. Anyone have a comment on that? Sarah. So he's just not doing very well. He's very pale. He has to hide in his home. He cannot go out during the daytime. So he goes at night. Um, he looks kind of lonely and sick. Do you think that's, um, some people think that's foreshadowing of what Dickens intended to do with him later. That... It says so in the comments. So the comments say it. I didn't uh, think about it before, so the comment. Well, there, I mean, there are, you know, 200 and some people have tried to complete the novel, so they will clutch at any straws. Martha, did you have anything? You had your hand up? No, nope. okay. Yes, he is not doing. He is not doing well. He is uh, living in London under the eye of Mr. Grugis at uh, Staple Inn, I believe, or Furnival's Inn, one of the two, and um, studying the law. And let's see here. Let me go up here. And Mr. Chris Barkle comes to visit. Uh, in this this chapter after. Um, and of course, he says a whole bunch of stuff about Helena, which is uh, pretty obvious, I think, what it is that Mr. Chris Barkle now feels for Helena. Introduction of a love or a, yes, a romance plot. So let's see here. This chapter was not, uh, to me, it was, was not particularly um, wonderful, I guess, in terms of having stuff to talk about. We, but the big event that we know is that um, Grugis is watching Jasper because Jasper is in London, uh, slinking around. Uh, let's see, let me see if I can find that. Um, yes, Mr. Grugis says something about on page 190. Seven or eight, somewhere around in there. Um, if you'll kindly step around here behind me in the gloom of the room and will cast your eye at the second floor landing and window in yonder house, I think you will hardly fail to see a slinking individual in whom I recognize our local friend. So we know that, um, that Jasper has been making the trip up from Cloisterham to watch um to watch apparently neville um so let's see here but this chapter is also important because um it introduces a new character at the end and that's tartar 
What was your reaction to the introduction to Tartar? We'll talk about Tartar's apartment in just a minute. Thoughts and comments about Tartar? Glenna. Um, yeah, um, he's, there's almost a different tone. Well, Chris Parkle is talked about in somewhat the same tone, but some of the other characters, it's more ambiguous how you're gonna feel about him. And Mr. Charter is presented as this kind of um, ray of sunshine, uh, health, uh, you know, conceivably redemption. Um, so it's a very much at variance with the way we feel about Edwin and uh, Neville, both of whom seem, you know, like they have their issues. Wouldn't you? Uh, wouldn't you say that it's almost a fairy tale characterization? Yes, I would. There's there's something there is something uh, there is some Prince Charming element about him, um, Marini. Yeah, actually, doesn't he say Jack and the Beanstalk? I mean, it is Jack and the Beanstalk. Tartar is lovely and he's so refreshing. I mean, not only is he as a character um, full of life and color, but the garden, the, we, we see his garden and it's really a compare and contrast with poor Neville who's drawn and haggard and anxious and Tartar is just, um, oh, well, let me make you a garden. Let me, um, yeah, very, very fairy taleish. And Jack and the, I, I could swear that Dick and somebody said Jack and the Beanstalk, and that is what it seems like. Well, we're going to come back to that in, when we get to the chapter that describes his place. But, but yes, he is introduced as a very favorable, um, say, uh, I think, Glenna, you said savior, uh, redemp redemptive character. I think there is, that is something to be said. Um, and in the next chapter, Dickens introduces yet another character who has been the subject of intense speculation on the part of the people who want to complete the novel or want to know how Dickens completed it. And that is Datchery. What was your reaction uh, when Datchery came into the story 30% um, into it? I shall wait. I shall wait. Sarah again. There is one sentence that keeps repeating itself about him just coming uh, to live on his own means. So, so this sentence of his intention, why he is there, repeats itself, which uh, gave me a feeling that it's not the right reason. So that, that it's just an excuse. Have you uh, read a lot? Have you read a lot of Dickens, Sarah? Not at all. <laughs> this is my introduction who, to Dickens. Yeah. Would someone who is well versed in Dickens care to comment on uh, Datchery's catchphrases? Anyone? That's a, that's a very good catch, Sarah. Um, uh, since no one is gonna volunteer, I'll tell you myself. Uh, remember that these books were published in monthly installments. And so people would only get 32 pages a month and they'd have to wait another 30, 60, 90 days, 19 months in all for one of the big books like David Copperfield. And so one of the ways that Dickens would help you remember a character is to give that character a physical characteristic that is mentioned frequently, um, like a mustache or, or often a verbal tick, some sort of catchphrase. Um, Mr. Micawber and David Copperfield, something will turn up. Um, with Datchery, it's definitely an idle buff, uh, buffer living on his own means. Um, Duffer, buffer, whichever one it is. Uh, just as a reminder that he doesn't have to reintroduce a character. He can give you in a, in a shorthand sort of way, 
a reminder of who that character is. And he does this all the time in every book because every book was published in installments. And so it's a mnemonic device. You don't have too much to worry about in this book because Datchery is introduced fairly close to the end of the material that Dickens wrote. Glenna. Well, and not, I entirely agree with what you're going to say, but some of these catchphrases became part of the culture. I mean, my parents adored Dickens, and my mother was always quoting Macabre or Barkus is Willing from Copperfield. And so, you know, they have all kinds of, they have all kinds of uh, valences, I guess is what I'd say, that they're they're helpful, but they're also, when they have a particular um, memorable, memorable nature, um, they live well beyond the life of Charles Dickens. And certainly Bah Humbug falls into that category, although I think Scrooge only says that twice. But you're right, uh, some of the did come in. Uh, Barkus is Willing from David Copperfield certainly uh, is fairly famous for people who are familiar with, with David Copperfield. So what is so fascinating about Datchery? What, is, what, is, what makes him stand out to you? Everyone's very shy today. David. You need to unmute, David. Okay. There you go. It seems fairly clear that he's in disguise. We keep getting emphasis on his big head and his hair which is likely to be a wig. D does it seem as to you as if Dickens is overplaying his hand here? Well, I don't think he want, is trying to keep the reader from knowing that Datchery is in disguise. He's not telling you who it is. But uh, I think the something he's told you earlier is pretty suggestive. Well, for those people who completed the novel, there are, I mean, this, this is such a split as to whether Datchery is someone we've already met or someone else entirely. And I, uh, the two completions that I read, which are the ones by Leon Garfield and a newer one by... Uh, David Madden, uh, who's a, a British guy, well, Garfield is too. Uh, Datchery is, is not a character we've already met, but someone else, um, someone who is uh, in the employ of Mr. Grugis. Anna, what would you like to say? What stood out for me was also that he shows up and he's looking for inconvenient lodgings in the town <laughs> where no one, you know, where. There aren't a lot of people. And he also makes mention of wanting a lodging with architectural, an architectural lodging, going back to like uh, the cathedral is what I'm thinking about. So yeah, I think he's a undercover detective. I mean, that was my impression. Yeah, many people, I mean, there are people who think that it's Helena Landless in disguise. And there are people who think that it's Edwin Drood in disguise. And there are, um, even people who think that it's Grugis in disguise. Uh, so if you have one of those opinions, I will be interested in hearing it later on in the discussion when we get past the material that Dickens actually wrote. But we'll leave, uh, we'll leave Datchery for a minute um, and we'll go back to, I think, one of the most important chapters in the book and that is the shadow on the sundial, which is, you know, clearly one of the, the highlights of the story. Um, what was your initial impression of that whole chapter? Uh, 
Martha. You unmute, Martha. I was devastated by the chapter. I, I thought it was creepy. I thought it was disgusting. And I just felt for her. I just, it, and, and he just is the worst thing on earth. That's all I can say. Was it, uh, was it a surprise to you that he had came, come on so strong or? Um, I wasn't surprised of his interest because we sort of knew that from the beginning of the book. Um, but he did come on pretty strong. And when he, she would give him um, um, indications that she was not happy, he didn't back off. And that, and so it just made it get worse. Marinie. I, the, I, I agree with everything that Martha said. It, it felt, um, I wanted to take a shower afterwards. I just thought it was the creepiest. I, I could barely even look back. I'm sorry that they picked, well, I guess her face on the cover of the penguin is fine, but it was so awful. He's um, among other things, among you know the possibility that he's killed his nephew, um, among the, lots of bad things about him. It's his um, his blindness and deafness to to the reception of what he's saying. I mean, the the more she reacts, the more he. I mean, it's really just awful. Um, predator, just oh, terrible, terrible reaction. I hated it. I know that some of you uh, were part of the our mutual friend uh, discussion that preceded Edwin Drood. Um, I mean, remember, this is the book that Dickens wrote five years later, but it's the next book that he wrote after he finished Edwin Drood. Does, did anyone see or can you describe a similarity or a connection between Jasper and Bradley Headstone? Hmm. Glenna. Well, obviously, both characters are obsessed, obsessed with a woman and uh, and both both characterizations, I think are, are stunning and striking characterizations of a kind of a monomania and what it uh, does to a human being when, I mean, they're exaggerations, but they're also, I think, exaggerations that have truth about human nature to convey. Do you think that did you, th did you think that Jasper represented maybe a, a, a I'm trying not to lead you on uh, into a specific answer here, but does Jasper feel like a uh, an increasing maturity in Dickens's portrayal of sexual jealousy, or is it more of the same? Um, I I don't know that I would say increasing maturity. Maybe uh, uh, variations on a theme. Um, obviously both. Headstone and uh, and Jasper give the objects of their obsession the creeps. Unwanted, yes, Anna. Um, he reminds me of Uriah Heep in David Copperfield, especially the uh, sleaziness, uh, <laughs> almost a physical descriptions <laughs> of uh, Uriah Heep, and it's that that was probably the creepiest chapter of all reading it and every time he's blocking her, keeping a smile on his face in case someone's looking out the window. And I thought, oh my God, that's Uriah with Agnes. So that, that's it. Thanks for that. Dan. Yeah, I think um, Jasper embodies this stalker archetype that kind of Dickens is leading into toward the end of his career, really all throughout his career. So he's not just Headstone, but I'd argue he's also Eugene Rayburn and John Harmon to an extent. He's Uriah Heat, but he's also Sidney Carton. He's, you know, even earlier on, you have this uh, Simon Tappertit and Barnaby Rudge or people like that who are, well, they're just kind of stalkers. I mean, they're not just monomaniacs, but eronomaniacs who kind of pursue these love interests throughout the throughout the novels. And at first they're kind of innocuous. They're, you know, they're not very, uh, they're just comic relief almost, but toward the end of his career and really in this novel, Edwin Drood, I mean, they become not only villains, but protagonists that are an embodiment of these kind of stalker, arch stalker archetypes that Dickens is interrogated really throughout his canon. Well, I think that's a good point. I mean, Simon Tappertit 
is more of a comedic figure, even if he may not be funny in a Me Too world, but there's nothing funny whatsoever, I think, about John Jasper and very little, that, if anything, that's funny about Bradley Headstone. Wayne. Yes. I don't have much to say, except is, is there any chance that Jasper is stoned at this point? I don't know the long-term effects of opium. I, I know you could, you could kind of get a top off if you wanted by taking log, but I'm also I, suspicious that Dickens took a, some hints from the Moonstone by his friend, Wilkie Collins. But anyway, it's, in that case, this chapter could be a foreshadowing of, uh, let's say the effects of opium on Jasper. Interesting. I hadn't thought about that, and I've read the book quite a few number of times. I, I felt like, I mean, my reaction was he's very much aware of his psychological state. He's just not in control of it. And I mean, my view as we get to parts later, I think that there are elements that maybe what uh, Jasper was not always in um, aware of his state of being. But uh, Sarah. You need to unmute, Sarah. Uh, just about the comparison between uh, our mutual friend and here. So in both cases, they, they, they are convinced that they'll be able to get the girl if they eliminate the competition. But uh, in this case, uh, Jasper gives up on eliminating Neville. He tries to get her. He doesn't he doesn't proceed with initial plan to eliminate the competition. He, he, he threatens her that he'll hurt Neville. So there is a change here. There is a difference. And I wondered, does, he, does it mean that he gives up on being able to implicate Neville? And he gives up on trying to kill Neville? Did you think he was trying to kill Neville or trying to blame Neville for Edwin's death? He, he tried to blame Neville, uh, but why, why doesn't he proceed with his original plan to kill the, the guys who are competition to him and then, then approaches her? So he ch has kind of a change of plan here, right? Well, I'll open that up to, to others. Well, first, uh, call on. I don't think I quite agree with you, but I will uh, open it up to others. But first, we'll hear from Cynthia. I was thinking about what Sarah said. And to me, this chapter, which happens after the disappearance of Edwin, proved to me that the uncle was the killer because he had eliminated the competition. Does that make sense? Because? He did not approach her in this creepy way directly until he had killed his nephew. And he knows, because he found out in the last installment that Rosa turned down Edwin. So they're really, I, I, I don't really agree with you, Sarah, that Neville was ever perceived as being a serious contender for Rosa's uh, affections. I, I think that Jasper's focus on Neville is to pin the murder on him, not to worry about him being an, uh, a rival for his own affections. I think as I think Cindy's Cynthia's hitting uh, hinting that Jasper didn't think there was any competition left, and so why wouldn't Rosa want to? So, uh, if we go back to the last chapter of the previous uh, lecture, mm -hmm. remember when he's told that they they are not getting married, he freaks out like he totally like, uh, and then there is a. Uh, um, let me see, um, Septim Septimus kind of contemplate with himself because at that point, Jasper doesn't yet know that Neville loves uh, Rosa. And uh, Septimus starts thinking to himself how much he should, he should uh, 
tell because he, by telling, he said, he might add evidence that leads to the, it, it, yeah. So, so then, then Septimus decides to tell. And remember, a just person, nature of the action is just after he comes out of his panic, like I killed for nothing, he said, oh, actually it's good news because now it tells me that maybe he disappeared, he's still alive. But then after Septimus tells him about Neville, he changes his mind. Uh, do others agree with that? He, he goes back to accusing Neville. He doesn't continue with his break where he said, oh, he's, he probably disappeared, so we can let it rest. And then Septicus tells him about Neville having an affection, and then Jasper changes his mind and wants to follow, accusing Neville. I don't know. Anna. I think um, Jasper is just frustrated, and he's telling Rosa that um, there are my labors in the cause of a just vengeance for six toiling months. Crush them. And then he says, there is my past and my present wasted life. There is a desolation of my heart and soul. There is my peace. There is my despair. Stamp them into the dust. So you take me. We're even mortally hating me. So, I mean, he's just tired of waiting those six months since uh, uh, Neville's, uh, Edwin Drood's death. And he thinks that by time he should get Rosa no matter what. So he's just frustrated that there's no way that she, he can convince her that he would love her. That's my take. Okay. Certainly, uh, I think those of you said that it, this is upsetting, creepy, whatever you described it, it certainly upsets Rosa quite a bit. Um, and she decides to, to fly to London. And I do want to read a paragraph aloud. Martha, are you, do you have your book in front of you? If you would open to page 220. And before I have you read um, the paragraph that starts, she ran over in her mind again. I just want to talk a little bit about mystery novels. So mystery novels, that, as we know them today, are pretty much a product of the 20th century. And in the early decades of the 20th century, the conventions that surround uh, mystery novels were being created, invented, many of them by Agatha Christie. But uh, one of them that is present, I think, and what I'm going to have Martha read in just a second, is what I would call the middles. So in mystery novels, there are often middles, and, and the, the living detective novelist Elizabeth George is a master of writing the middles of mystery novels, where the characters debate endlessly about what may have happened. And if you will read aloud, Martha, the paragraph she ran over in her mind, the whole paragraph, then we'll talk about it. Okay. She ran over in her mind again, all that he had said by the sundial in the garden. He had persisted in treating the disappearance as murder consistently with his whole public course since the finding of the watch and the shirt pin. If he were afraid of the crime being tra traced out, would he not rather encourage the idea of a voluntary disappearance? He had even declared if the ties be between him and his nephew had been less strong, he might have swept even him away from her side. Was that like his having really done so? He had spoken of laying his six months labors in the cause of a just vengeance at her feet. Would he have done that with the violence of passion if they were pretense? Would he have ranged, uh, ranged them with his de uh, desolate heart and soul, his wasted life, his peace, his despair? The very first sacrifice that he represented himself as having making for her was his fidelity to his dear boy after death. Surely these facts were strong against a fancy that scarcely dared to hint itself. And yet he was so terrible a man. In short, the poor girl, for what could she know of the criminal intellect which its own professed students perpetually misread because they persist in trying to reconcile it with the average intellect of an average man, men, average men, 
instead of identifying it as a horrible wonder apart. apart. Could he get by no road to any other conclusion than that he was a terrible man and must be fled from? So I think this paragraph accomplishes several things. What might some of those be? Is, is he not so cagey that he's just trying to get people to think differently of him? Well, that's certainly one thing, Maroney. Well, the um, lest anyone, I can't imagine who would be working up sympathy for um, Jasper, but let's, I mean, in case anyone was, um, I know that this idea of the criminal intellect was something that interested Dickens and the idea that some people have no conscience, no remorse, um, and the he's as much as saying this is one of those people. That this, this is he's not secretly a good man. <laughs> it's really what, is, a man. what is it telling us about Rosa? That she's much more with it than we might have thought in the beginning. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, she's not one of his his vacant Dickens's vacant females. I mean, she's she's thinking. I mean, she's being pushed to such extremes emotionally, but um, she she's thinking. She's connecting things. Lana conclusions. I don't have much to add to what Mirani said, but yeah, I mean, in the latter part of the of what we have of Edwin Drood, we learn more and more about really Rosa is a fairly formidable character. And she's had this terrible upset. I mean, really horrible, horrible upset, um, which unfortunately <laughs> reflects what a lot of women have to deal with. I mean, it's not purely in the realm of fantasy that a man will let a woman know that he has all this power over her and make her feel constrained. But instead of just panicking, she is trying to make a rational accounting of where where she stands, where he stands. And it's it's very impressive. Marilyn? I, th I agree with all the statements about Rosa. I think in her analysis, she's describing that Jasper's conscious behavior does not fit with him having committed a murder, but it does bring up the idea that his unconscious behavior might be something else. And I, I do think this does like two or three things. One of them is that it really shows that Rosa Budd is unfortunately named because she's way smarter than a character that would be named Rosa Budd. Uh, she is, you know, she was the one who figured out that she and Eddie were mismatched and she was willing to speak out before he was. And here we have her being, for the first time realizing that she may be alone in suspecting a man who is, has, has a, a spotless character in the community. And yet she suspects him and she, at the same time, the reader gets this beautiful, uh, expo exposition that doesn't feel like exposition that reminds you of a whole bunch of things that have already happened in the story. But we now know that Rosa is thinking differently from anyone else. Marilyn, are, do you have anything to add or were you, were you ready to speak? I just spoke a minute ago. Okay, I'll take your hand down then. Um, so, so we now know that Rosa is, I mean, she's she's on to Jasper, whether rightly or wrongly at this point. Um, and she uh, she decides to fly. And one of the things that I found uh, particularly disturbing was a sentence that was, uh, let me see, where was it? It was on the next, oh, it was on the bottom of 221. It was the first time she had ever been even in Cloisterham High Street alone. Did anyone catch that sentence as a, was that surprising? 
I think it's a uh, Martha. Were you going to say something? You're uh, you're muted. That did not surprise me because I think that was the way girls comported themselves, particularly if they were in a girl's school, they were probably told by their elders, you know, be, be careful, don't go wandering around town, you know, stay as a group, um, spend most of your time here at the house, you know, at the school. Um, so that wasn't surprising, but it, it indicated by it, Dickens, that this, the author mentioning it, that it was an issue that she might be in danger. And that, that's how you interpret it, Glenna. Yeah. Well, it's not surprising because it, pursuant to what Martha said, um, women were not in public much. I mean, I, not to blow my own horn, but I wrote a book called The Rise of Public Woman. And it dealt with sometimes, particularly after dark, if a woman, there's a case in New York, a woman after dark uh, was in New York and looking for an address. And she asked a couple of men for the address at which point she was, arrested for solicitation. And so, you know, a woman by herself always was at risk for being treated like a quote unquote public woman, which was not a, a public man was a positive thing, but a public woman meant prostitute. Well, if I recall correctly, the only other time that Rosa has been in the street in this novel is when she goes out walking with Edwin. And she has the lumps of delight, I think. Um, but it just, I think, was a reminder also of how I think we're supposed to realize that her act of being alone in the street was an act of courage, that she was really called to, to do a desperate thing. She was so frightened by this event that she uh, broke all the norms that Glenn is talking about and decided that not only would she be in the street alone, she was gonna get into a carriage alone and go all the way to London and find her benefactor, Marini. That's exactly what I was gonna say, is that she's so overwrought and, and with good reason that um, she's, she's, not, she's not processing any of that. She just, she needs to get out. She needs to get away. She needs to get to a safe place. Grugis, is I think rightly the only person she can think of because Helena is gone and um, she just goes. I don't think she's thinking, oh, I'm breaking the rules. I don't think she's thinking. I think she is kind of a monomaniac. I've got to get to Grugis no matter what. So I get the feeling that fear isn't even a factor for her. It's just go. That's good, thank you for that. So she gets to London and uh, she, I get, uh, we, we find out that Mr. Bazard is off duty, which may or may not be important unless you think that he is Datchery. Uh, and uh, Grugis quickly mistakes Rosa as if she were her own mother, which is just another one of our reminders about how Grugis carries the torch for um, Mrs. Mrs. Budd many years later. And so this is where Forster ended the fifth installment. He broke an existing chapter that, uh, that, that, oh, wait a minute. Yes, she flies to London. Um, we are, it, also in that chapter, we are told, I think in case we, had missed the point maybe earlier, Dickens says directly, he was Helena's unfortunate brother to her and nothing more. So those of you who were holding out for hope, poor Neville, I mean, poor Neville, that he might get happiness at last, uh, not gonna happen, uh, not gonna happen. So she she goes and she throws herself on, on Grugis's um, mercy and the, the number monthly number ends, but that's not where it would have ended had Dickens written it because the next chapter, a recognition that uh, where we come back to Tartar, Tartar's house, uh, it would have been part of that same chapter. Um, so let's talk about Tartar's apartment. Um, let me see here. 
So we find out that Groot, that uh, Chris Barkle and uh, Tartar are old buddies together, um, schoolmates, a fag, if you will, um, which obviously has a different interpretation. It means a younger boy at a public school who takes care of um, making the bed or doing whatever, running errands for an older boy. Um, and then we get to, let's see, we get to this wonderful description of Tartar's Chambers. But that's in the next chapter, isn't it? Um, let's talk about Tartar's Chambers. That's the opening of chapter 22 and the beginning of what is now part six, the last, the last part that Dickens actually wrote. So Maroney's already mentioned that it's the phrase Jack and the Beanstalk is in there somewhere. Um, what, what did it remind, what's the purpose of this lengthy description? Glenna. Um, I wanted to talk about this because this, I think this is so interesting. In the 19th century, the, what, what's been called the ideology of domesticity was powerful. And often it was used in terms of the angel in the house being the, the woman. But here, all this rhetoric about domesticity is used to, you know, give, um, to valorize, shall we say, a male character. So it's not just a woman as the angel of the house. And you find this, um, you find this, type of description of Harriet Beecher Stowe talking about uh, the Quaker housewife in Uncle Tom's cabin. You find um, in actually the Russian great Pushkin, one of his short stories, he's describing a, a character and using this rhetoric. And I think it's just fascinating that Dickens was not, I mean, there's one other moment that is not the angel in the house where um, in Nicholas Nickleby, when Smike is uh, playing with Nickleby, with um, Nicholas, and he says, you are my home, or words to that effect. Mm -hmm. So that the character, whether it's male or female in Dickens, who can create this type of domestic uh, order, coziness, comfort, uh, that has all kinds of ramifications beyond the purely architectural. David. One thing about the description of, of Tartar's rooms is it's the sort of thing Dickens would have liked himself if he had been living by himself. He was a tidiness freak and his children suffered from this. He would affect <laughs> their rooms and dump. Uh, Expect to expect orderliness from them, and before he started writing, everything had to be in the right place. So I think he thoroughly approves of Tartar. One of my favorite things about having gotten involved in Dickens Universe ten years ago, twelve years ago, was it changed the way I read Dickens, and I'd been reading Dickens for thirty-five years at the time, and suddenly I was opened up to this idea of magical spaces. That there are places in Dickens where specific spaces get described way more than they deserve if they're just rooms. And I, Tartars is one of them. For those of you who um, have read other places or other, other Dickens novels, uh, The Peggotty Ship in David Copperfield, it's way bigger on the inside than it is on the outside. Um, I think that's one of the places that is. Raya's roof in Our Mutual Friend, um, Miss Havisham's room in Great Expectations, where time seems to have stopped. Um, Dickens loves these spaces, and I think just as Glenna said, there is something incredibly safe and, and welcoming about this space. Not only is it neat and tidy, but it's covered in greenery. I mean, it 
it's it's like the green wood, if you will. It's although that might be a, a bit of a stretch. Um, it's certainly a safe space, and it's going to be a place where uh, Helena and Rosa can can hide and come and go and and see their brother. Um, it's it's really amazing. Um, and of course, in that it is beanstalk territory. And let me see where that. What page that's on, just in case you missed it. It is on page 240. Well, it's somewhere in that chapter. It's well, it well warrants uh, reading it again, and as Marini pointed out, that it is Jack and the Beanstalk. It's on page 238. Or oh, thank you, Marini. The just near the top. Um, and our blush is among the fruits of the country of the magic beanstalk. And it's mentioned later in the page in a parenthesis, more blushes in the beanstalk. Yes, there it is again. And of course, it's Jack that's being referenced, not the giant, just in case anyone wanted. Um, <laughs> um, and then in that same chapter, I mean, uh, in, in one of great Dickens's kind of great twists of the story, he introduces the Billiken and immediately puts her in uh, conflict with Miss Twinkleton, who arrives between her two states of existence. I do wanna point out in that chapter that um, Rosa wavers in a divided state and uh, Miss Twinkleton is in her two states of existence uh, in that chapter. So once again, Dickens is sounding that note about characters who have multiple facets to their, their selves. I, I, I don't know whether any of you picked up on this, but um, Miss Twinkleton likes a lamb's fry. Did anyone read that? Did anyone look up what a lamb's fry is? Marini, you did? Uh, yes, I did. I read the note. <laughs> what well, was there, you know, I actually did. A little did bit of, of um, trivia that I didn't, need to know, I don't think. Oh, I thought, well, I did, I did most of my work in the Everyman edition, so I only looked at the Penguin every now and then, but well, the, obviously the editor felt that you needed to know what a man, yes. uh, lunch fry was. Now we do. Um, <laughs> I, I lived in Oklahoma, I already knew. <laughs> And they call it a lamb fry there, or did they call no, it, it Rocky Mountain Oyster? It's not lamb, it's, it's cows, uh, you cows. know. Territory folks, et cetera, no, no sheep in Oklahoma, but yeah, I knew what it was. Okay. Like Carl, I, I think you skipped over, or at least I, I'd like to just stop for a minute and talk about how romantic, the before we get to Miss um, Billiken, it, the, it, the two very gentle scenes I, I've, are the ones that, um, are kind of restorative to me um, are Rosa and Mr. Grugis's office, you know, or, or, or his home when, when she's fled there. And then this um, interlude with Tartar, you know, you feel that there's light and love in the world and it's not all dark and threatening and all of that. And then Billiken gave me a giant headache, but anyway, <laughs> um, we were back. <laughs> <laughs> well, did that surprise you that those chapters, the, those two sections, the, the chapter between Rose and Grugis and then the introduction of Tartar, did that surprise you or are you just noting that it's a difference in tone? How, what, what, well, what so I, I think I'm just noting because I know that Dickens does that, you know, the knocking at the gate Macbeth. He, he does give the reader relief. And so I wasn't, I wasn't completely surprised because you, you can't bear that. Or, or I mean, it's hard to sustain that dark. Dun, 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 dun. You need a break, and that was a nice break. Billiken, I think, was meant to be a break, but I, she's no Mrs. Gamp. She's no Mrs. McStinger. I, I didn't. She didn't work for me, but I think she was meant to be comic and light. Also, I just didn't like her. And they cut her out of the 2012 adaptation completely, but I'm sure an actress could, the right actress could make the Billiken um, somebody that would be more memorable perhaps than she is on the page. 
Right. <laughs> well, thank you for, you know, thank you for pulling me back. I, I do want to spend, now we're going to get to the last chapter that Dickens wrote. Um, I, I know everything has to come to an end. It's very sad. Um, let's see here. Carl, so, um, yes. We have a raised hand. Yes, Sylvia. Oh, hello. Yes, uh, the Watchers to Dickens Festival. Um, I was asked to do with some friends that chapter and, and the Rose's meeting of Mr. Grudius. I was Mrs. Billikins and I played it very amusingly, I hope, with Cockney accent. <laughs> Well, I, I apologize. Really, I bet you were wonderful. <laughs> really, really, really amusing. The way that she's so candid about everything. She says, oh, you have to be prepared for the leaks and going up the stairs and all that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm sure that Miriam Margulies could play Mrs. Billiken and make, Billiken and make her memory. Yes. <laughs> um, Thank you for that. I'm sure, Sylvia, you were wonderful. Um, there's so I, definitely... I, love, I love Mrs. Billikins. I think there's a bit of Mrs. Billikins in me. Too candid. <laughs> <laughs> there is, uh, yes, um, sweet smelling rooms, I'm sure. Um, so this last chapter, uh, it wasn't the last chapter that Dickens intended to be um, in uh, even in part six, but unfortunately, that is how it is. Um, let me go here. To, let's see. Let's see here. So in this chapter, so many things happened, um, but we start out with uh, a small past tense sort of summary, and then it shifts into present tense again. Um, and uh, we start out with Datchery meeting Princess. Sylvia, were you done speaking or I just take your hand down? Yes. Um, so we meet Datchery, or Datchery meets Princess Puffer and uh, he learns a bunch of things. Um, and we hear we hear quite a bit from uh, Princess Puffer in that. What what was your reaction to what? Let's see. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm talking about the wrong thing. We are talking about um, Jasper is talking to Princess Puffer. I'm sorry. I. We, uh, we find out that Jasper was, as they call it, a sweet, she calls him a sweet singer. Um, what do you think was important about this chapter? Or this, the, this part of the chapter with Jasper and Princess Puffer talking? Martha, you're you're muted. Was she not talking to somebody else about Jasper? She had bumped into somebody and found out that he knew Jasper, and so she started talking to him about stuff. And I forget, and it's it's somebody that I can't think of who she was talking to, but it was. Um, well, on page 257, it start, a long conversation starts between, uh, bet between Jasper and um, Princess Puffer. If I'm not, I'm, I can't be mistaken. Yeah, Jasper comes yeah, back. It, you're right. It, it's in the beginning, and he's come after a two-month hiatus. And she says, oh, it's you, dearie. And he says, yes. And she says, oh, you've been mi mixing on your own. Oh, okay. okay. And of course, what she learns or what he learns here is that he wasn't unintelligible after all. If we go back to that opening chapter where those, the Chinaman and the Lascar uh, were unintelligible to, to uh, 
Jasper, and he assumes that he himself was unintelligible. Uh, he wasn't unintelligible after all, at all. Um, he, he said a, a, quite a few things. Um, and as he gets, um, as he gets, I don't know, stoned, whatever you want to call it, uh, under the influence of the opium, he, he, he does talk quite a bit um, and reveals a whole bunch of things to her and uh, to, the, to the reader. Um, thoughts or comments on this whole, this long section. I mean, it's pretty clear he did something bad to somebody. And there are arguments that, that it wasn't Edwin at all, it was somebody else that maybe he, he was, uh, maybe it was Neville that he pushed off the, or maybe he was imagining it, Glenna. I was just gonna say, it seems very clear that whatever is going on here is gonna be central to the working out of the plot later on. And, um, you wonder if how safe Princess Puffer is going to be. And there are some people who believe that she is Edwin's, or a, she's the grandmother, that she that uh, she's Mrs. Dr she's Drude's father's mother, Sarah. You're muted, Sarah. So, so he comes back and she says to him what happened. Like she thought while he was mourning, he'll need the opium more than ever, but he, he didn't come back. So how long are we talking about? How long did it take him to come back? Well, we, we don't know. We know that the opening of today's reading was six months later, but if he had been to see her I don't think there's any reference of it. So this is the first time we, the readers, get to see him visit her since the beginning of the novel, which is possibly uh, nearly a year earlier. So, so he talks about uh, the first time, the first uh, uh, period that he came. And he said, I had a plan. I was going to do something and by coming here and doing it in my mind again and again and again, eventually when I actually did it, it was very easy and fast, right? Yeah. So he, he came to her to practice something that he wanted to do. And it might be the killing of uh, Edwin Drood. Then he doesn't come to her for regular comfort after, after he, while he's mourning, and now he comes to her again for a similar purpose. He wants to play something in his mind again and again, so it will be easy for him to do it physically. And mm -hmm. I wonder if what is, and, and, and then later she says, I won't let you get away a second time. So she talks about him doing the same thing a second time, and I was thinking maybe the second time he's trying to kill Neville or somebody else. I'm not sure. I think the second time refers to her attempts to follow him. Does it not? I, I, I felt this is the second time of the sequence where he's coming to practice something. He said, if I played in my mind with my opium again and again, then doing it in reality is very easy. So he did it the first time, and now he comes to do the same exercise again. So he has something that he wants to accomplish in reality and practice with her, with the opium. Cynthia. Um, is this in the last chapter? Because I don't remember reading this in my copy, and I, I can't find it. Is it chapter 23? The dawn again is chapter twenty-three. Yes, I, 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 I that's strange. I, it doesn't seem to. Perhaps I've made a mistake, but uh, 
I don't remember reading it and I can't find it, but uh, that's strange. Oh, do you, what, do you have the Penguin edition? No, no, it's, uh, it's a collection of Dickens. Uh, it's quite a, I mean, it's a pretty long chapter and it's, it is the last chapter that there is. Yes. And it's called The Dawn Again. Yeah, so, so what I remember is she goes to the cathedral and hides behind a pillar and she watches Jasper but doesn't actually talk to him. So I shall have to investigate that. Thank well, that you. Happened, that happened earlier. Oh. That happened earlier. Um, yeah, I don't remember where that, uh, Cynthia. I'm, think, I'm thinking that the reader is meant to link this to the conversation that Princess Puffer had with Edwin. Mm -hmm and that there's some continuity in the story because of this linkage with Ned. Remember she had heard the name Ned? Right, that's the day that she lost, that's the day that she lost track of Jasper, right? Right. So she's not gonna lose track of him again. Um, so I, I think that happened quite, quite a bit earlier. I have to admit it all starts to blend together for me. Um, and I haven't read last month's stuff for a month. Um, but she has the same similar conversation with Datchery. So she does, she does, um, she does meet Datchery. Um, that e in fact, that evening, she goes back to Cloisterham right after she sees uh, Jasper, she she runs back to Cloisterham and she says, "I'll not miss you twice." So this time she's going to follow him and she's going to keep him in in her sights. And she runs into Datchery instead, who asks her all sorts of questions. Um, let's see here, and then. Um, and then Datchery keeps score the old tavern way. So as, as we know, if you read the material that I sent you by Andrew Lang, Helena Landless wouldn't know how to keep a bartender's score. So, cause she's an ignorant girl from Salon. So um, I never thought she was Helena anyway. I'm sorry, if you did and you can support that, great. But uh, it was never in my mind. So, on the last day that Dickens was conscious, he sat in his little Swiss chalet, which was a little uh, manufactured home, if you will, but someone had sent him, I forget who, and he had built, uh, he put it on his property at Gads Hill, which is south, or outside of the city limits of Rochester. And he, he uh, it was on the other side of a road and there's a tunnel that, Lee, that he took so he wouldn't have to cross the road. And he went to this little Swiss chalet where he wrote. And on the last day, June 8th, uh, 1870, June 8th, yeah. Um, he, he wrote in the morning and, and he, then he stopped and he wrote some letters. And then that evening uh, around dinner, he collapsed. Well, that this, the official story is he collapsed at dinner. He, the unofficial story is he might have been uh, in London at Ellen Turnan's house, and his uh, stroke-ridden body was put in a put in a cab and taken back to Gads Hill so that he could die at home. I mean, you can believe what you want, um, but I do want to read what, one of my favorite paragraphs in all of Dickens. Um, it's on page two hundred and seventy of the. Uh, Penguin edition. It is uh, about two, less than two pages away from the last words that he ever wrote. A brilliant morning shines on the old city. Its antiquities and ruins are surpassingly beautiful with the lusty ivy gleaming in the sun and the rich trees waving in the balmy air. Changes of glorious light from moving boughs songs of birds, scents from gardens, woods and fields, or rather 
from the one great garden of the whole cultivated island in its yielding time penetrate into the cathedral, subdue its earthly, uh, earthy odor and preach the resurrection and the life. The cold stone tombs of centuries grow warm and flecks of brightness dart into the sternest marble corners of the building, fluttering there like wings. I don't know that Dickens ever wrote a more beautiful paragraph and to know that he wrote it on the last day that he was hours before he lost consciousness and a day before he died is uh, very special. Oddly enough, there uh, is something that is not in your Penguin text, despite all of the uh, appendices, and it's something else I want to read to you. So as I've told you, um, in the last monthly installment, it was uh, padded a little bit to fill out the, the number of pages. But at the very end of that last monthly number, on the last page, someone, probably John Forster, wrote this note. After Datchery has made his marks and falls to with an appetite, the following paragraph was at the bottom of the page. All that was left in manuscript of Edwin Drood is contained in the number now published, the sixth. Its last entire page had not been written two hours when the event occurred, which one very touching passage in it grave and sad, but also cheerful and reassuring, might seem almost to have anticipated. The only notes in reference to the story that have since been found concern that portion of it exclusively, which is treated in earlier numbers. Beyond the clues therein afforded to its conduct or catastrophe, nothing whatever remains. And it is believed that what the author would himself have most desired is done in placing before the reader without further note or suggestion, the fragment of the mystery of Edmund Drood. And those are the last words that a reader of the monthly installments would have seen. And that was dated August 12th, 1870. So two weeks before that last monthly installment was published. So, then what happened? The floor is open. But if you, uh, oh, David. Having trouble unmuting there. I just wanted, one of my fascinations in life is the ancestors of the mystery in the 19th century. And I wanted to mention one of them where the issue uh, is, is he dead or is he alive? Which is a, an issue in this book, a fragment and that's uh, Sheridan Le Fanu's Wilder's Hand, which was published in 1864, and which I highly recommend uh, as an early mystery with surprises. There are at least two places that really got me in reading it. You cut out for a second, David. Could you repeat that title, please? Wilder's Hand, W-Y-L-D-E-R apostrophe S, Hand, H-A-N-D, which is a pun. Uh, I, don't, I wonder whether Dickens knew it. I would think that he or Collins might have run across it since they kept an eye on it <coughs> being published successfully. Like, you know, I have not read any Lefano. I have Uncle Silas and I, I get, well, I, I guess I have, I read Green Tea a long time ago, but, um, and of course, Sheridan Lefano wrote uh, Carmilla, which is one of the early vampire stories too. Um, I'll, I'll have to check that one out. Glenna. Um, reading the, is it Lang? Uh, the yes, Andrew Lang. 
Andrew Lang, really I found so stimulating and it convinced me that um, in, in that Collins illustration was really uh, helpful and kind of doping this all out for myself, but it convinced me that Edwin Drood was still alive and that um, I don't, I don't find either Helena or um, Drew to be convincing as um, Datchery. I think it's more probable that it's somebody of uh, Grudge's uh, employment. Whether, I mean, ba was it Bazard? I don't think he's very plausible because he's so entitled. But, um, you know, some, in, some um, relative of Mr. Bucket in Bleak House. And I think, I think it's also plausible that um, that it's impossible to pin any crime on Jasper until he pushes Neville off the tower. So I found I found a lot of the um, ideas put forth in the Lang uh, piece to be quite plausible. And um, I don't know whether anybody else came to this kind of a conclusion, but it's like. Oh, I won't be tortured anymore. I think I know what would have happened. Well, you know, the reason I sent that out is because I think it has an outstanding summary of what actually happens in the story. Yes. Irrespective of whether you believe that how he what he does with those things is the is where Dickens would have gone. Kathleen. Hi. Hi. Yeah, I just want to call your attention if you don't know already, to this um, current issue of The New Yorker. It has an article called, um, on getting high in the 19th century. Hmm. So um, I began it, I haven't finished it, but it's certainly relevant to um, people interested in the opium aspect of the story. And when you say the current issue, what is the date of that? For that those of is, us who get both the hard copy and the online one. Yeah, like, this is my magazine. That's too blurred. What's, oh, what's, sorry. Uh, what's, what's the date? April 24th and May 1st. Okay. They, they combine months now. Is that better? Is that no. the one past? That's the one after the, the Trump court. Yes, right, okay. yeah. Um, yeah, just had to tell you that. Because it's right, it's right on the topic of opium. Well, I have read two completions. I have read one by Leon Garfield. In fact, when that came out in 1980, I had not yet read Edwin Drood, and I was uh, 35 years old, 25 years old, 25 years old, um, and I had not read Drood. It was the last book. I couldn't figure out why anyone would read a book that wasn't finished. And by then I had already read most of the novels twice. So I bought the Leanne Garfield completion and I became fascinated with uh, one of the items that Garfield picked up, which is mentioned in the Lang version. And that was the idea that, uh, or mentioned somewhere. Um, and that was the idea that Jasper was a divided self and picked up on that and that the mechanism for the divided self or dividing the self might be opium. And that uh, Jasper became a different person um, such that those of you who read the introduction to Drew knew that at least one of the descriptions of what was gonna happen in the story that the, that the murderer was going to confess as if the murder were, con were conducted or completed by someone other than himself. And uh, the Garfield one uh, elaborates on, uh, on that, uh, such that Garfield thought that if Dickens had lived, Robert Louis Stevenson would never have needed to write The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, which was not published until January of 1886. Now that grants Dickens a sort of that extends his mastery of psychological insight maybe per, beyond where some people might think he was capable of going, but I'm not, uh, I, don't, I don't know. I, I became fascinated with that. And so I read the book several times. There's another one that was finished in around 2015 or 2016 by David Madden. And that has um, 
that has a very different ending that is not described by in, in any of the materials that uh, were extant at the time of Dickens' death, either the memories of Kate Peregrini or John Forster. But I will say that it, it ends with a flourish that Dickens would have been proud of if he had thought of it. Um, other comments, how, did, how would you have ended this? How do you think Dickens would have ended it? Um, there is a, a 2012 adaptation that is available on DVD that uh, is very non-Dickensian and the director and screenwriter said that she, she completed the story in the way she wanted it to end, which required her to make some changes in material that occurred early in the book, stuff that Dickens actually uh, didn't write. I'll just give you why. I think you should watch it because I think it's well done for what it is. Uh, and it takes some of what, some of the theorists, uh, into consideration. The one thing it does that I didn't care for is that makes Mrs. Chris Sparkle's cabinet more of a homeopathic drug store. And you find out that Mrs. Chris Sparkle has actually been feeding some of the opium to Jasper. Uh, I didn't care for that. Um, but the reason that the reason that the, the scriptwriter put that in there is that they wanted Mrs. Chris Sparkle to be extremely um, sympathetic to John Jasper's character and very anti Neville. So the fact that she was abetting his drug habit was, I guess, supposed to make us think that she was a sympathetic character to him. Alexis, you're muted. You're muted, Alexis. And I can't. Sorry. Only... There um, you go. Uh, you'll have to forgive me. I'm on opium. I'm recovering from a serious injury. But did you discuss the D case, the book, the D case? It's, I think it was out in the 80s, two Italian gentlemen. And what it was was a mystery uh, writer sort of convention. And they're getting together to, to discuss Edwin Drood and the various, you know, their way of ending it. And what would be, there would be a section that was from the mystery of Edwin Drood, mm -hmm. and then a, a, a section of the mystery writers, and on and on throughout the whole book. It's really uh, great fun. I read it when it came out, which was in the 80s, so I cannot discuss it now because I haven't Me read either. it. Yeah. I haven't read it since. Um, I, uh, I know that one of the, uh, Megan Kelly, who couldn't be here today, she has a copy of it. She's going to read it. I don't have a copy at the moment. Um, mm -mm. It may even have been one of the books that I donated to the Dickens Project, which I did a couple of years ago. So I, I no longer own it. Um, if anyone else has read it, it's it's very it's very like in that Umberto Eco sort of uh, uh, like Name of the Rose kind of thing, where it's a convention of famous fictional detectives who are coming up with their own opinions about how the book was going to end. And as, as Alexis says, the book is threaded through with D Dickens's actual text and uh, interspersed with uh, symposia where people like Hercule Poirot present their theories about how uh, Edwin Drood might have ended. Um, I remember it being entertaining, but that's about all I can remember. It's called The D Case. And I do, uh, it's written by two Italian People, I'm sorry, I've forgotten their names, but it is definitely called the D case. It is available through Amazon as a used book, but that's all I can recall. Sylvia. Um, I've just got a couple of questions, please, Carl, that I've been wondering about. Um, Dickens doesn't seem to give us any descriptions of what Edwin is like physically, whether he's fair, Dark, blue eyes, brown eyes, slim. I wonder, and I wonder if it's on purpose. Is there a description? Does anyone know anywhere? He's just had I a haircut. I do remember he's just had a haircut. And uh, oh. I, I do remember him saying that, uh, that or, or somebody comments about his hair being shorter. Uh, it's, let me see here. That'll be Rosa, won't it? 
Well, I don't have it at my fingertips. If someone does, uh, I seem to remember him being fair and blonde. And if, oh, you look, really? if you look at the illustrations that show him, he yeah. definitely looks uh, young and slender and fair skinned. I'm trying to find the picture in but front of the One expects he'd be like that to be a contrast to Neville, but I was looking out for a written description and I didn't come. Didn't does, come your, uh, does your edition have the illustrations? Yes, and I did find that bit. I must have fallen asleep and then the next night <laughs> missed two or three pages, Carl. Okay, I well. In the wee hours. <laughs> I guess that's what I, I think um, if you look at the, the the illustration that's called at the piano. Yes. Right. You yes. Can see that Edwin is here over here holding the fan. He looks yes. like a very fair, very blonde right. young man. Um, and, and, and the, the other one that, that's opposite page 66. In yes, the I remember the picture. Yes. And the other question is, Carl, that um, we're repeatedly told that Jasper is Edward's uncle, but but how it, I sort of worked out, well, he can't be his father's brother because he'd then be called John Drood. He wouldn't be called Jasper. So is he then the younger brother of Edwin's mother who died, but we're never told how she died? Well, that, that's what the Andrew Lang article posits, that, oh. <laughs> that, that uh, Jasper is, is Mrs. Bud's brother. Mrs. Bud or Mrs. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not, uh, Mrs. Uh, Drude, Mrs. Drood's brother. Mrs. Drood's brother, yes. So she would have been right. a Jasper, as, I mean, that's the theory, that she would have been a woman whose last name was Jasper and- yes. It's strange that it that you know that's not mentioned. Oh, and there was also something about like they were um, uh, Mr. Drood. They were engineers, weren't they? And if if Jasper had been related to them, then he would have gone into the engineering firm, and he didn't. So I think he's got a, a, a grudge there, not only about Rosa, but the fact that Edwin's um, going to inherit uh, part of the engineering business, presumably or at least some money. Hmm. But yeah, but if, yeah, brings up more questions. Thank you. You're welcome. Other, other comments, other, who, who would end this differently? Marini. Well, based on some conversations with Carl, um, I did end up reading, um, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, which I just finished, um, point one. The other is that when we did the Drood at the um, universe, we did it with the Moonstone, um, where the solution to the mystery has to do with duplicating the altered state of mind. Mm -hmm. um, the one, one possible ending to me, and maybe somebody's already done it, but if so, I haven't read it, is that to me, Jasper is guilty. He did do it. He does have that evil side. But perhaps um, it would turn out that like Jekyll and Hyde, his opium side, his kind of evil side, took over more and more and more so that he didn't know <laughs> That, well, he would know that he did it, but he wouldn't be um, he, he wouldn't be responsible in the same sense that he would be not on opium. And then all, to the end where he's in jail, um, he has a, a, a um, reckon, you know what he he, like um, Dr. Jekyll, realizes what has happened um, and that he did do it and that he probably did kill Neville also, and then he's hanged. <laughs> that's my ending. <laughs> that's all, the end, period. <laughs> I don't know, and maybe a Dickensian chapter after that where everybody gets married. 
Um, John, I told you I was going to call on you. I'm sure you've read a number of the completions. What are your, what are your thoughts after 40 some years of thinking about Dickens and thinking about Drood? I'm, I'm not a, a student of the endings. So I can't uh, speak with any kind of authority about the different attempts to complete. I have always believed that, that Edwin survives. I think that uh, he's not dead and that uh, Jasper believes he has committed the murder but that he has not in fact. And that the beautiful paragraph that you read and other features of the novel, including Tartar and the wonderful uh, fairy tale dimension and, and also melodrama. Tartar is a character out of the nautical melodramas of uh, uh, the 19th century that, uh, the ones that the ones that Miss Twinkleton was reading to Rosa. Yes, yes. Um, so I think there is a fairy tale, an improbable fairy tale happy ending to the novel, in which Jasper meets the end that he deserves, and uh, and, and there is a mystery that is resolved, but not a murder that is solved. I've written a number of novels and I have a very hard time imagining how Dickens was going to sustain this story for six more months. It feels way more than halfway done to me. It, it feels as if it would end in four more installments rather than six, but uh, it, one of the completions, the, the David Madden completion does attempt to replicate six additional installments and it feels very forced and it feels like there's a lot of material that is certainly subpar for Dickens. Thank you, John. Maroney. Maroney, do you have something to add? I mean, your, your hand is raised, or did you put it up? Oh, David. I thought you were thanking me. I'm oh. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> David. Oh. <clears throat> The romantic endings, I think Chris Parkle is going to marry Elena. Uh, nobody's going to marry Neville because given the racial attitudes at this time, an English young lady wouldn't marry a wog. So she's going to marry uh, What's his name, Lieutenant uh, Tartar? Tartar. The one of the things that's not yet accounted for is the large pile of lime that Jasper observes. That's at least a strong hint to where, as to where someone would dispose of a body. I don't know what ending Dickens had in mind. Well, Lang has, Lang has one. And the interest, one of the interesting things in that Lang article that uh, I sent out is that Lang has a physical layout of the, of the um, Sapsi tomb being outside of the crypt. That it's, that, and he has, uh, he has Jasper wheeling wheelbarrows of the lime across across this courtyard, an imaginary courtyard between wherever it was stashed and wherever Jasper needed it, which was to put it in the, ja in the Sapsi tomb. Um, and I didn't picture that. I always imagined somehow the Sapsi tomb to be in the crypt, but that doesn't really make sense. A tomb would normally be outside um, in the churchyard. And so, um, it makes Jasper be, uh, to be a very active 26 year old man uh, moving wheelbarrows full of uh, quicklime in the dark in the dark of night in the secluded and uh, abandoned or abandoned and empty courtyard of the 
churchyard. And Lang says that's why Jasper goes up to the top of the tower is so that he can look down on the emptiness of the cathedral close and figure out that he would be able to accomplish his goal, which would be to stash a dead body in the tomb uh, using the quicklime that is in the crypt. I think that's where it is. Um, so uh, again, it's called, the article is called The Puzzle of Dickens's Last Plot. The Puzzle of Dickens's Last Plot by uh, Andrew Lang, and it was written in 1905. And you should be able to find it pretty easily. It's a Gutenberg document. So what Courtney sent out was simply me going into Gutenberg and copying the whole file and putting in it into Word and rearranging it so that it was easy to send out as a document to you. But you should be able to find that on gutenberg.org along with all the other things that are there. So David, I would recommend that you give that a look for it's extremely thorough. And it also has an excellent summary of the story as Dickens that Dickens actually wrote. Carl, can you tell me the name again? The puzzle of Dickens's last plot. I've just listed it in the chat for those looking for the link. I've oh, just put the Gutenberg link. In thank there. you. Thank you very much. Um, and Carl, if you'll send that link, I can forward that on to folks as well. Okay. As I said, I would recommend the, um, the 2012 adaptation. Uh, all the actors are really good. Um, I've forgotten the name of the actor who plays Jasper. He's, um, he's the guy who's playing Perry Mason in the brand new Perry Mason. Um, it was a British act, a British stage actor, Matthew Reese. Matthew Reese. He's definitely not twenty six. I will say no. that uh, the guy and and the guy playing Edwin is uh, practically Nordic. He's so fair and so blonde. Um, the Landlesses are quite brown. They are they are quite uh, South Asian looking. Um, but I would I would recommend that just if for nothing else for the characterizations. And for those of you that are fans of Miss Marple, uh, Julia McKenzie, one of the later Miss Marples, plays Mrs. Chris Barkle, and she's all she's so prickly, she's almost not likable. Um, so I would recommend that the Leon Garfield completion of Edwin Drood is out of print, but it is available through various uh, of the secondary book sources. Certainly available through uh, Amazon. Uh, I think that. Marini found it on A Books or Ex Libris or one of those Daedalus, one of those many, many, many used bookstores or eBay. Um, I, I did find some copies on eBay. It's one of the few Dickens uh, source material or secondary sources that I've actually kept after all these years. So we're almost done. Is any further questions or comments that people want to make for the good of the order, Marilyn? I wanted to ask um, about the jewelry that Edwin had when he went missing. The ring that was in his breast pocket and the fact that he sort of brings attention to the watch right before all the disappearance happens. And that when I went through the Lang article, I said, gee, you know, I don't think I've come up with a full explanation of of that, you know, it's almost like he knew he was going to disappear and he goes and makes sure that that watch is really evident and that somebody can place it on him. And then where does the ring go? And that ring seemed important enough that it should come up in any solution. And I didn't know if anybody had any thoughts about that. Well, if I recall correctly, Lang says that uh, Edwin took the watch and the off himself, right? And left it at the weir or Jasper took it off at the weir when he thought he was killing Edwin. I, uh, David. You're muted, David. Not an answer to the previous question. I think one of the elements of the 
end of the book was going to be that deputy would have witnessed something very inconvenient. He gets enough space that there's some reason why he's there. So I saw the uh, the adaptation, the musical, the musical adaptation, the mystery of Edwin Drood when I was in New York in uh, 2012 or 2014, the one that Sharon Weltman lectured on at Dickens University a few years ago. And the conceit is that a music hall is putting on the mystery of Edwin Drood and it stops where Dickens stopped. And then you get to vote on who the murderers were, uh, who the lovers, you get to vote on the murderer and the lovers. And uh, the night that I was there, um, Princess Puffer was played by Cheetah Rivera. And the lovers were voted by my, the audience the night I saw it as, as Princess Puffer and Deputy, because that meant that Cheetah got to sing another couple of lines. So uh, Deputy clearly, David, his point was he was gonna be Princess Puffer's lover. Um, at least that's what I took away from that. Blair. Just, just a question. Uh, to you, Carl, we're running out of time, but I don't think I've heard any mention. You mentioned what you think of the 1925 film adaptation that was made of Edwin Drew. Uh, are you familiar with it? And what do you think of the solution presented there? Now, you mean 1935, the Claude Rains version? Oh, yes, I'm sorry, I meant 35. Yeah, 25 would have been a silent version, yeah, no. Well, I think it's very competent. I, I mean, I think that the character is a, I think Claude Rains does a great job again. He's not 26, but I think in, in setting up the mood and taking the story that Dickens might have written, I mean, it's, uh, if, if you're interested you can, and you work hard enough, you can find it on YouTube as, or excuse me, you can find it on the internet as a bootleg file. It is not on YouTube, but if you keep searching, you will be able to watch it on a website that shouldn't have it because it is copyright protected. So it's not on YouTube, but you can find it. Um, you, your library might have it. It was hard to find. Um, it's available, I think, on Turner Network or Turner Classic Movies if you have a subscription to that. But the, the clever and resourceful Googler will be able to find and watch for free the Claude Rains version. And, and it's, it's very stylish. I mean, I, I would have to say I liked it. Dan. Yeah, does anybody know how to find the Robert Powell version of Edwin Drood? I don't know if we talked about that or not, but that's the one version I haven't seen and I'm kind of looking for. I just, I can't find a full copy either online or in DVD copy. I couldn't find it either. I couldn't find it. Now, Maroney's cohort, Megan Kelly, who they run the New Orleans chapter of the Dickens Fellowship. If anyone can find it, it would be Megan uh, as a, a librarian. She has access and knowledge that the rest of us mere mortals do not possess. So if, if anyone comes across, if Megan comes across it in her research, I will let uh, Courtney know about it. But uh, no, I haven't uh, been able to come across it. Thanks, Dan. So we are coming to the end of our time together, our three months on Edwin Drood, and you guys have all been wonderful. Um, I hope we'll see some of you, or uh, that I'll see some of you at Dickens Universe this summer, where we'll be discussing A Tale of Two Cities for a week. Uh, registrations are currently being accepted on the Dickens Project website, which you can find. John, do you have any comments about the, the uh, Dickens Universe this summer? There's an outstanding list of speakers planned, um, some of whom are well known to people who have attended previous Dickens universes and some, uh, some who have, uh, are, are less familiar but who are uh, outstanding, including Catherine Gallagher of UC Berkeley, uh, who's uh, one of the uh, most important uh, Victorian scholars. Uh, of her generation. And um, our friend Christian Lehman will also be speaking, um, who's known to, to many. Uh, 
And speaking of Christian, if you type in his name and Ava can spell it for you, he has been doing a YouTube uh, online discussion of A Tale of Two Cities in chunks over the last few months. I, I think he's almost done. So if you're interested in A Tale of Two Cities and you cannot be at Dickens Universe, uh, Christian is as always ent- not, never less than entertaining um, and always wanting to talk about illustrations, uh, something that, that I don't normally talk about. Um, and I know he'll watch this later and he'll be upset that I didn't mention the, the uh, illustration that shows Lobley. One of the strangest illustrations I think in any Dickens novel is, this, is the scene with Rosa and Grugis on the boat and Tartar's face is obscured, but for some reason, Lobley's face is in full view of the, of, uh, the uh, viewer and a strange and wonderful character he must be. Uh, Glenna. <clears throat> Excuse me. I, it breaks my heart to say it, but I may not be physically able to attend the universe. And I understand from Trudy that it's really onerous. And I understand that for Courtney to try and pull off a really complete virtual, uh, which I say, uh, echo of the in-person. And I'm wondering, is there going to be any virtual? I'd love to come in person. The good Lord willing in the creek don't rise, but I'm not sure that I can. Yes, Glenna, um, thanks for asking the question. There will be a virtual registration that will include the plenary lectures and perhaps a few small group discussions, but mostly the plenary sessions. That's really good to hear. And is that registration currently available on the website, John? I is believe it is, yes. Yes, it is. Thanks for asking that, Glenna. Well, you guys have been a wonderful group to uh, shepherd for the last three months. And um, I'm always, I always enjoy talking about Dickens, but the, over the years, Mystery of Edmund Drood went from being a book I didn't know I should read to being actually one of my, some of my favorite material in all of Dickens. Um, and this read through or the last year that I did this, uh, my impression of Rosebud has improved miraculously. And uh, but even my impression of, of Lucy Manette rose when I last time I read Tale of Two Cities, which leaves Dolly Varden near the bottom of the pack um, for the simpering female characters in, in Dickens. So if there is nothing else to say, I will bid you all farewell. And I hope we I, see I want to thank you, Carl, on behalf of the Dickens Project and uh, also to let people know that the next meeting of the Pickwick Club will uh, feature a speaker from the University of New Mexico, uh, Professor Heisen Stolte, who will talk about Dickens and Victorian psychology, and he will also address the mystery of Edwin Drood. So uh, it will be a continuation of the fine work that you have led us through, Carl. And again, just thank you so much for your work. Well, it's an honor and a privilege. I hope to see some of you at Dickens Universe and to see you at future lectures here. Thank you very much. Goodbye, everybody.